Turn in your copies of God's holy and inspired word to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we are continuing to look at background of the ministry uh, that God in Christ, through the Spirit, through the Apostle, and through ministers and laypersons, what was happening in Ephesus that it would help us as we, Lord willing, ever get to actually studying the, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. If I were to have alternatively titled the sermon this morning, I would have called it Pentecost Comes to Ephesus. But in keeping with what we're doing, the title this morning is Ephesus, a place of bold, Christ-centered, spirit-filled ministry. Let us hear the Lord speak to us from Acts chapter 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Do you, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue, and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to involve the name of the Lord Jesus, over, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and it found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that through the ministry of Grace Covenant Church, that your word would be bold among us here, and that through us, your word would come to be known here in Paulding County and beyond. We pray that the spirit that is described for us here in Acts 19, which is the spirit who is with us today, would continue that mighty work of your word through the ministry of your church in bringing people to salvation and freeing believers from bondage to idols. 
Do that in this church, Lord, as we are those who still struggle with sin, who have idols of the hearts, and who do not experience the fullness of the freedom that you have already granted us in Jesus. Do this, we pray, for the glory of your name and for the good of your people. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There is a whole lot of, and this is a a technical theological term, weirdness going on in this this passage. There is a whole lot going on here uh, that is certainly outside of the normal experience that you and I and most other believers have on a daily basis. And because of that, sometimes what can happen is that as we approach a text like this, we can start thinking, well, this maybe should be normal. Maybe this is normative for the church. Maybe this kind of weirdness is what it really means to be in Christ and to have a spirit-filled ministry. And it can be tempting to think that. In fact, there have been Christians Uh, throughout the ages, uh, especially um, since the latter part of the 19th century here in America, who have said, if you are a real church, these things will be normative in the existence, in, in the everyday ministry experiences that you have. Now, what we find here in this text is a very important uh, text for the big picture of what God is doing in the unfolding of redemptive history and what we see is something very special happening within the ministry of Ephesus itself. But what we also see here is something that does still go on in the church today. So, I'm not going to try to unfold all the details here. We're going to keep a big picture view of this because I don't want us to get lost in the details and somehow miss the meat of what is here as indeed what we are seeing unfolding here in Ephesus is that Pentecost has come to Ephesus. Now, by Pentecost... I am referring to that powerful coming of the Spirit that you can read about back in Acts chapter 2, which was a fulfillment of a promise that Jesus had made to the disciples in Acts chapter 1. As I said last week, if you want to understand the book of Acts in terms of the big picture of what is going on, is you look at Acts 1.8, where Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. What we see is that there is a special coming of the Holy Spirit that has not happened in redemptive history up to this point. And it's coming for a very specific purpose. In fact, when we get to the letter to the Ephesians, Paul's going to explain the theology that is being described in the historical events here. But what is happening here is that the Spirit, Jesus said, would come in this special way and it would give power to his people to be his witnesses. And their witness would start right where they were, and then that witness would start growing geographically, and it would grow, and it would grow, and it would grow, and it would grow. This coming of the Spirit is, there's a beautiful picture here, and I wish we could spend the whole time on just this one point, but we can't. But there is this this beautiful use of, of, of a literary device that God has done from the very beginning of creation and in the unfolding of redemptive history going back to Genesis 1. This idea of the Spirit coming upon you. We see this from the very beginning of creation as God has created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, but we are told that 
that creation is formless and it's void. It doesn't have a specific shape and, and it's empty, it's dark. And what God begins to do as it is pictured in the Spirit hovering over the waters of the original creation is that God, through His Word and Spirit, starts to form that creation into what He wants it to be and He begins to fill that creation with what He wants it to have. There is this, this ministry of God through the Word and Spirit of forming and filling. And in the creation week, that beginning of creation is described as being all dark. How is day seven described? It's all light. Day seven is the only day in, in the creation week that is not described as having evening and morning. And so in, in, in Genesis 1, from the very beginning, there is this picture of what God is doing. He is forming and he is filling through his word and spirit. What we have here in Acts chapter 19 is through the ministry of the word that we began to look at last week as Apollos was exegeting Christ from the Old Testament. And the ministry of the word as laypersons were encouraging the minister with Christ in terms of the, the fuller revelation of what Jesus had done. That there is this, in Ephesus, there is this focus on the ministry of the word. And the ministry of that word is focused on Jesus Christ. Exegeting Jesus Christ from the scriptures and embodying Jesus Christ to one another. Now what we see here is as that ministry is continuing to unfold, that ministry of the word that is continuing to unfold here is we, we see this special ministry of the spirit making it very effective. The spirit is coming upon these men who did not have the full gospel, who had not received Christian baptism. These are men that are living in what Acts 1.8 would call the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the spirit that came upon creation to form and fill it. Oh, by the way, see, I'm going to talk about things I plan not to talk about. Not just in creation, but in incarnation. What does Gabriel tell Mary? He doesn't just simply say, hey, you're going to be the, the mother of the Savior. He tells her how it's going to happen. The Spirit is going to come upon you. That same description. And so this time, not in the darkness of original creation, but in the darkness of this virgin womb, the Spirit is described as coming upon in order to form and, and to fill that womb with the Savior, with the God-man, Jesus Christ, in the incarnation. We are told, and Paul gets into this in Ephesians 1, that it is the Spirit that comes upon the grave and raises Jesus from the dead. We're once again in this dark place where there's no life, the Spirit comes upon it and brings life out of death and forms and fills Jesus Christ in his resurrection. That's what the Spirit here in Acts 19 has come to do. He has come to continue that ministry of the Spirit that began all the way back in Genesis 1. And this time it is to bring forth out of dark of dark hearts and men who are dead in their sin he is bringing them to life and forming and filling them with the message and the reality of their savior jesus christ and so once again the spirit is coming upon these men through the ministry of the word and what we see is through the ministry of paul as he is preaching uh, this word, the, the Spirit comes and he does this miraculous, this incredible thing of bringing dead sinners to life. 
this ministry of Paul is marked by a boldness in the Spirit. It is marked by a freedom that he has as he is free from the fear of man and as he is filled with the trust of God. And as he is one who has seen this God validate his ministry in being called face to face by Jesus Christ into life, being commissioned face to face by Jesus Christ to become an apostle and having the Spirit uh, empower his preaching and his ministry. Paul has that confidence that God is at work not only in him but through him. And in that confidence, he continues to minister the Word of God. But notice here, I want to point out two words that we don't tend to, to look at within reform ministry. Notice here that it says that Paul not only was, was boldly preaching, but it says that he reasoned with them and he persuaded them. Now we believe, as good reform folks, that the Lord is sovereign in bringing people out of death into life. We believe he does that through his word and spirit. We saw that going back to Genesis 1. It's throughout the, entire, the entirety of redemptive history. But sometimes we mistakenly think that what that means is there's no role for us to play. Or whatever role there is for us to play, it doesn't need to involve persuasion or reasoning. Because we think the Spirit is the one that's going to do things, and so just let the Spirit be the Spirit. But notice here, we are told that Paul, who understands this sovereignty better than you and I ever will, this sovereignty for him means he reasons. He makes arguments from the Scripture. And he persuades. He makes good arguments. And the Lord blesses these arguments with an effect. He reasons. He persuades. Now, on the flip side of that, sometimes in the reform world, we do kind of really get into reasoning and persuasion. But can I suggest sometimes, and when I've seen people with a, good, a great zeal for doing so, they do so not in the power of the Holy Spirit, but thinking that the power is in the reasoning and in the persuasion. You see, the reality is for you and for me is that we constantly live in this struggle of living in the Spirit. We will, we will find all kinds of ways to use living in the Spirit as a way of checking out of living the Christian life and engaging and, and not engaging in ministry. But then we also forget that we are in the Spirit, and therefore we, when we do engage in the Christian life and when we do engage in ministry, we do so in the flesh. The sweet spot that we are seeing here in Ephesians is this sweet spot of relying on the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit making the word efficacious or effective in accomplishing God's purposes. Paul doesn't know what God's specific purposes are, but what he does know is that God has said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so Paul, through the power of the Spirit, engages in boldly preaching the word of God. And notice the effect. The effect is not only that there are these men who come to know Jesus Christ and come to salvation. The effect, we are told, is that the whole region starts to hear the word of God. Now, I asked you last week, what do you want in the ministry of Grace Covenant Church? And I ask you that again. Do you want a spirit filled ministry of the word of God that converts sinners 
and that spreads throughout Paulding County, that starts here with us in our lives, in our families, in this church, and then spreads forth, then let me suggest that that confidence that the Apostle Paul had in the presence of God through the Holy Spirit is something that we should be actively cultivating within our personal lives, our family lives, and our church life. Sometimes in reform, in reform circles, we are so careful to make sure that, we, that, that we're correcting the, the misapplication of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that we actually forget the application. And so as we move into this next section of Acts 19, what I want you to remember is as things really get weird here, the spirit that is causing the weirdness is the same spirit that resides in you and resides in me. It's the same spirit. When we move into this next section, the result of this, this bold preaching through the power of the Spirit, we are told in verse 20 that the word of the Lord in, continued to increase and to prevail mightily. The word of the Lord that was going forth because of the Holy Spirit, it was increasing and it was getting stronger, and it was getting stronger, and it was getting stronger. And part of that is revealed in this, this extraordinary work of God. Look at verse 11. As, as we get into some of the weirdness here, notice what we are told very specifically. God is doing extraordinary miracles. It's not Paul who's doing them. Paul is the vessel. Let me put it in another way. He's the shovel. He's a shovel. He's a rake. He is a tool in the hands of God. There is not anything special about Paul here. It is not that Paul has some kind of intrinsic power or, or some kind of intrinsic authority because he is special. Paul is a shovel like any other shovel in the hands of God. There is nothing special about Paul here. What is special is what God is choosing to do through him. And what is he doing? Well, he's doing these extraordinary miracles where in extraordinary ways, people are experiencing the power and the presence of God in these unique, special ways, even including um, physical healing. Now, we're told from the book of Isaiah that this is one of the signs that you know that the, the true Christ, the true Messiah, has arrived. And what the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 2 is that the salvation that God planned from the beginning, that he began to execute through Christ, that is, he is continuing to execute through his church— it says that this salvation was declared first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is this, in the transition within redemptive history from the old covenant promises to the new covenant fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the Lord does these special things to help people know that this really is the fulfillment, that this is valid, that this really is the, the, you know, the, the accomplishment of what he promised. And so he does these special things in unique ways as a way of calling attention to the veracity of the message of the gospel. What, the reason that you listen to Paul is not because he does have good reasoning and good persuasion. 
The reason you listen to Paul is not because he has a following. The reason you listen to Paul is because God tells you that this man speaks on my behalf because look what I choose to do in and through him. This is all about validating Paul. And one of the ways we know that here in Acts 19 is in this really weird situation of spiritual warfare where there are these Jewish exorcists who try to exorcise a demon from this guy. And what does he say? Jesus I know and Paul I know. I ain't got a clue who you are. This is all about a testing of who Paul is and why you are to listen to Paul. Because God has chosen him and is choosing to speak through him and is acting through him. God is doing all of this. He's chosen Paul to be his shovel. And that's why you pay attention to Paul as the shovel. That's what's going on with the weirdness. That's what's going on with the extraordinary nature of some of the things being described here. But what that does, beloved, is that gives us confidence for better understanding the ordinary things that the Spirit is doing here, that the Spirit continues to do in you and me. This is why in Reformed circles, we tend to refer to our ministry as a ministry of the outward and ordinary means of grace. That doesn't mean that what we do is boring, even though some Reformed people in the past have made it so. It doesn't mean that it's supposed to be boring. It doesn't mean that it's supposed to, you know, only be about reasoning and persuasion. It doesn't mean that it's not supposed to be happy and spirit-filled and all those kinds of things. What it means is that there are things that God has chosen to do and there are ways that God normally does them. And what we see here in Acts 19 is the ordinary work of God through the Word and through the Spirit in freeing people from idols. Ephesus was a place that was known to be a hub for the occult. It was known to be a place where it was very spiritual and where it was very new age. And uh, it was a, a place that people practiced divination and got involved in the dark arts. And what we see is that through the preaching of the gospel, the spirit is taking those people who are in darkness, who worship the darkness, and he's bringing them to life. And he begins forming them by the word and spirit and filling them with the word and spirit. And the result that we see here is not simply that they profess faith in Jesus Christ. What we see is that they begin to give up their practices of darkness. They begin to give up the idols of their hearts. Even to the point of it being very public and very costly. Beloved, in the ministry of this spirit, as he ministers today in this church, the Lord is seeking to free you from the bondage that you have to the idols of your heart. Since penalty has been paid, we saw that. We, we were renewed in the promise of that from Romans chapter 8, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The penalty has been paid, but sometimes what we forget is the power has been broken. And a ministry that is a spirit-filled ministry exegeting Christ from the scriptures and embodying that Christ through the ministry of the offices and the laypersons working together is a ministry where that power of the gospel will not just bring new life to people who are dead in sin, it will bring a deeper life to those who are drowning in that sin. And one of the scariest things that this text unfolds to you and to me is that the repentance 
that is necessary for us to experience that greater power of the gospel and that greater freedom from idols is a repentance that is not private. It is not something that we simply do in our prayer closet by ourselves. It is something that you do with those in the church. It's something that you do very specifically here with the ministry of the elders. Now, elders, I hope that that just caused you to skip a beat. Because this is scary. We live in a culture that equates being leaders with authority, that equates being leaders with power, that equates being leaders with getting people to do what you want them to do, or if, even if you have the best intentions, what you think they ought to do. Men, this tells us that being an elder in the church and being a part of the leadership of the church is a trust that is to be earned and is to be managed with all mercy and with all grace. We have to be the kind of men who not only speak about Jesus Christ, but who embody Jesus Christ to the point that people will trust us to come to us with their sin struggles. And I want, to hear, I want y'all to hear from me today that the way that I approach my ministry as an elder is just that way. I don't do it perfect, and I will mess up, as I said last week. But the intention of my heart is to be someone that you can trust, that you can come to, because the power of sin is rarely, if ever, broken in private. It is when the light gets shed upon the sin because you make it open to those who can be trusted with that sin that the power becomes to be broken more and more and more as there are men and women here in the congregation who help you bear that burden, carry it along with you, and encourage you to continue to take it to Christ, to take it to Christ, to take it to Christ. Because I can tell you, as someone who has been in ministry for a long time, who has done a lot of counseling, one of the primary things that I have seen in in individuals is that you think that God gets tired of hearing your confession. You think that God grows tired of extending his mercy. You think, if I confess this one more time, all he's going to think of me is that I'm a hypocrite. Beloved, he is your heavenly father who has given his son, who has granted you his spirit so that you would go to him with your sin. But you don't have to go alone. There are brothers and sisters surrounding you here, and there are specific men who have a unique calling within this church to help you bear that sin, to to listen to you, to listen to you confess sin, and to pray with you, to give you the encouragement that though you still sin, you are also still a child of God. And one of the reasons that we will do an assurance of pardon One of the reasons we will do a confession of sin in some form and an assurance of pardon in every service of worship is because it is the liturgy and the worship that we do in the body that forms and shapes the way that we live out our Christian faith. And if we're going to become brothers and sisters who who, who interact with the ministry of Christ through his spirit, where we are willing to open ourselves up to the Spirit, where we are willing to to get unsafe with the Spirit and allow the Spirit of God to, to reach into the depths of our heart and expose more and more sin. If we're going to become a people like that, we have to be a people who live within a rhythm of regular confession and assurance, confession and assurance. 
We don't confess our sins to feel awful about ourselves. We confess our sins to be renewed in who we are in Jesus Christ as those forgiven and those declared righteous. Yes, there are some extraordinary things that the Spirit is doing here in Ephesus. And those extraordinary things, we are told, are God's way of affirming to the people who were there and to affirming to us who would come after them that Paul's ministry is the ministry that God has through Jesus Christ, to affirm that to us so that we will listen to Paul And through listening to Paul, that we will cultivate a life in the Word and the Spirit that frees us to get unsafe. Do you want that in the ministry of Grace Covenant Church? Is that the type of Spirit-filled ministry you want here? Where we take a risk and we let the Spirit in And then we take a greater risk and we let one another in. Is that what we want? Because if we will approach the ministry in that way, beloved, make no doubt that the word of God will not only continue to be strong and to grow within this body, but it will, through us, grow and spread through Paulding County, through Greater Atlanta, throughout all of Georgia to the other most parts of the earth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is scary, but we trust you. And yet, though we believe, Lord, (laughs) help our unbelief. This is hard stuff, and yet it's exciting. It is so exciting to, to know that the Spirit that did this in the church in Ephesus is the spirit that you have given us. That the spirit who did those things in those people and bringing them to faith in, in breaking the power of, of idols, that that same spirit is ministering here, Lord. And so help us to, to not get caught up in the details of the weirdness of the things that were only a a special, unique ministry for that day and time and help us to focus and to cultivate and to long for that ordinary ministry of the Holy Spirit within this church. Starting first, Lord, with my own heart. Oh, Lord, convince us of the gospel and convince us that there is no sin within our hearts or our minds or our mouths or our, our feet or our hands. There is no sin there that we can find that has not already been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, continue to show us what is already forgiven. And Lord, make us a people who grow in our trust in doing this with you, that we will do this with one another. Because we sin against you, Lord, and we sin against one another. Help us to trust the gospel for ourselves so that we can trust it for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would glorify your name by doing a powerful work within this church and within this world. Not so that we might think that we ever become anything but a shovel, but that we could be shovels that bring glory to your name. We pray and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.